Hey everybody, how's it going? It's Friday. Happy May 2 for a weekend to everybody out there in the British Commonwealth. For the rest of you the world who doesn't know what the hell that is, it's just, it's a long weekend, and it usually means this is the time when the weather finally starts getting warmer. Welcome to SMG Viewers Comments, episode number 201. Let's get right to it. That's a beastly tone. I a lot better than your uninspired sounding rev generator tone. Dude, I'm so happy that you enjoyed that sound. Yeah, that was from the uh, PV Invective cabinet unbox and demo video. Yeah, the thing's just an absolute freaking monster. The blend between the vintage 30s and the cream backs really does add something really cool and you can be sure that Lancaster Audio will be offering up a set of impulses of that cabinet. Uh, just one small point I wanna make there to Mr. Golden Ears over there. Uh, we didn't actually use the Invective head uh, on that cabinet for that tone. What we actually used was my Rev Generator 100P as the head. So I must compliment you on your unbridled observational skills. I am truly blown away and I'm sure the rest of us are as well. Great job, dude. Well, Glenn, I'm 16 and I have no idea what I wanna do with my life. Who does? I've had my own home recording studio in my room for about two years now, and I'm thinking about maybe becoming an audio engineer because of my love for music, and I already have dabbled in recording. Do you have any tips or good advice to help me get me started? Uh, well, first piece of advice would be you better not plan on making a lot of money. See, the thing is, there's not only, you, not only are you in your home studio, but there's a million other kids who have little home bedroom studios too. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Learning the art of recording can be a very rewarding experience just in terms of, you know, making a living at it, uh, good fucking luck. It, competition's absolutely brutal and you better be able to offer something above and beyond what the other kid down the street's offering if you ever want to have any chance of being successful at recording music. Now that's not to say there aren't jobs in the audio industry. Um, film sound is something that still needs a lot of work. Um, you know, doing sound effects, Foley work, that kind of thing. Uh, that can be rather lucrative. I got a very good friend of mine who was uh, nominated for an Academy Award last year uh, for doing Shape of Water. I don't remember, recall if they actually won it or not. Apologies to my good friend Brad if I got this wrong. So with any luck, maybe I can get Brad on the show and we can talk about alternatives to recording music for a living. And yes, film work is definitely where it's at. A couple months ago, the drummer from Within Temptation talked in a podcast about recording drums, and according to him, computerized drums are going to be the future as it saves time and nobody can hear the difference according to him. What are your thoughts about this, Glenn? I think Within Temptation should probably think about hiring a new drummer. I mean, if you take a listen to their mixes, the drums are so fucking artificial and overprocessed. Anyway, I can understand why they don't need him on their records, but for those of us out there still making rock and roll music, uh, yeah, the real drummer and the, the nuances that he puts into that performance are everything. So I'd say to that drummer, dude, shut the fuck up. What's the best way for someone to learn how to play guitar when they have no musical history or previous experience? Dude, you sound just like me when I was 15 because I had zero fucking talent um, and no musical ability or skill or anything. And it just um, was a lot of trial and error. Uh, first and foremost, see if there's a music store in your area that offers music lessons, specifically guitar lessons. That'd be a good place to start. Uh, there's a lot of resources online and um, you can actually hire tutors online to teach your guitar in like a one-on-one -on -one situation. That might be the way how to go. The other thing would be to check out the Fret Zealot. That's the little add-on thing I did a demo on a couple months back. And uh, I thought that was incredibly helpful. Um, even as somebody who's been playing for 30 years, how it just maps it all out for you and, and lays it all out and makes it easy to understand. It's probably one of the easiest systems I've ever seen for learning how to play guitar. It's definitely worth checking out. Best of luck to you, man. Seriously, I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. The trick is, if you're like me and you don't have any talent at all, the big secret is don't quit. I need that t-shirt in my life, epic. Now, I rarely ever wear the same t-shirt in a row for two episodes of SMG viewers comments. I wore this in last week's show and I got a shit ton of positive comments. So what the shirt says is, got polio? Me neither. Vaccines work, dumbass. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make this shirt available for this weekend only. It's gonna be like a 48 hour sale or something like that. Um, the clock is on starting right now. So if you do wanna get one of these shirts, they're just gonna be available in a very limited run batch. So get one and tell the anti-vax idiots out there that we're not gonna let the stupid people win. Yo, Glenn, if I have no budget, what's the best way to promote my music? Social media, it's available to everybody. You can make YouTube videos, you can make Facebook posts, you can do Instagram posts. Dude, the world is your oyster. You have access to the entire world. All you have to do is make something interesting that people are gonna want to hear. Good luck to you. 
Wow, Instagram, so metal. Here's what you do when your bandmate bashes you on LOL Instagram. Make fun of your former bandmate for using Instagram. Now that's the wrong attitude, dude. Seriously, Instagram is a wonderful tool to reaching thousands upon thousands of people. More than likely, the target audience you're trying to reach with your music. If you're saying, well, I'm not gonna use that, I'm not gonna use that, you're just limiting yourself and you're going to shoot yourself in the foot before you even have a chance at any kind of success. I've worked with a couple bands, well, I don't do Facebook, and I'm like, why the fuck not? Why would you not take advantage of this amazing platform? An amazing way to get hold of people. I've never fucking understood that. What, you're too cool? No, you're not! Get on there and promo your shit! Having played drums and percussion for some 40 years during the times when very little was mentioned regarding hearing protection, guess what? I'm now retired and have to wear two hearing aids and live with tinnitus that sounds like fucking Carillion. I'm delighted to hear you advocating hearing protection. I couldn't imagine not advocating hearing protection. As a guy who literally makes his living with his ears, I'm constantly vigilant about taking care of my hearing and not listening to loud things for extended periods of time. Guys, there is no undo button when it comes to your hearing. You get one shot to take care of it and that is it. And once those little tiny microscopic hairs in your ear canals that pick up the sound, once those are gone, you're done. That's it. You lose those frequencies. So please, for the love of crop, take care of your fucking hearing. And yes, I am going to be doing a dedicated video in a few weeks about hearing protection for the metal musician. Be sure to watch it and be sure to share the living shit out of it because it's going to have some great information that's going to help you protect your hearing for life. Have you had any experience recording punk bands? If so, what would you recommend recording-wise? Cheers from Mormon Land and fuck you, Glenn. Well, if you're in Mormon Land, I can certainly understand why you would want to play punk and good for you, dude. Um, I've done all kinds of punk. I've done pop punk and hardcore punk and traditional punk. And yeah, yeah, punk's fucking great. I love punk rock. What are the, what's the big differences? I don't know. Maybe not as gain, much gain on the guitars, but you know, you're still running into the same issues with the shitty bass players. Um, and you really want to keep those drums as natural as possible. It's not some over-processed, you know, refined sugar heavy metal that we get these days. Punk is all about attitude and punk by definition should not be perfect. So stay the fuck away from the drum samples and let the rage flow. Get that emotion across the speakers. That's the most important thing about recording punk. But production wise, it is pretty much the same idea. 57 on the cabs, mic up the drums in the same way you would a metal kit. Just don't fuck with it. And especially don't fuck with it like you would on say, oh, I don't know, some uh, an Asking Alexandria song. I'm starting a studio at my house. Is an SM57 bad for guitar. Hey Jesse, that's amazing that you're starting out. I really do wish you the best of luck. Just get ready to put a lot of time in. It really does become your life at one point or another. Uh, as for your question, a 57 is a great place to start with mic and guitar. Mastering it might take a while. It took me about 10 years to really get it right. But even after recording guitar for some 20, 25 years or something like that now, uh, the first mic I still reach for when recording guitar is an SM57 and it still costs a low, low $99. So yes, it's definitely a good investment. It's a great place to start. The trick is learning how to set up your amp and position the mic. You can check out my videos, how to record heavy guitar. I'll try and put, um, I usually have a link in the description below to uh, that kind of lays it all out for you. And if you want to kind of shortcut that whole process of learning how to mic an amp, you can check out our premium impulse packs from Lancaster Audio. We've got one, we've got mine, of course, Glenn Fricker pack. Uh, we've got the Ulrich Wild pack and Ulrich did, you know, Pantera Deftones and, and White Zombie and all those cool things. And you can get his fucking tones. They're amazing. And uh, Trey Xavier's got a pack out as well. And he's got some really interesting tones on there. You can do uh, what's called hybrid recording where you use a real tube amp and then you get one of these guys, which is a torpedo captor. And uh, you plug the speaker out of your amp into this. And then you go the XLR out into your computer and then you run cabinet impulses and you get these fucking awesome tones and it lets you concentrate more on getting great performances instead of fucking around with mic placement like it took me 10 years to figure out how to do right. So uh, there's a lot of great options out there, man. Welcome to the wonderful world of recording. Um, it's frustrating, but it can be really awesome at times too. Best of luck to you, dude. On paper, having something like the internet where people can share how they got this guitar tone, what amp they use, the settings on the amp, and how they recorded the bass guitar, and what they did the bass track to get this massive bass tone, etc. You would think that this is great and that people would learn from each other and soon we would all see an avalanche of new amazing songs. In reality, people only focused on tone and recording techniques and forgot the essential. The song! It's a shame.
I'm gonna agree with that to a point. Yeah, I think songwriting might have suffered a little bit along the way. I remember when the Andy Sneap Forum came out, it was just this wonderful place for a lot of different like-minded metal engineers to share ideas. That's really where I started to learn how to record metal guitar well. There are a lot of other recording forums out there, but this is the first one that actually kind of specialized in metal. All the other engineers were metal engineers and we could just talk about how hard it was to get these fucking sounds. So yeah, now that I've got these um, this great skill set built up um, 15 years later, it's like I'm still waiting for the awesome songs to come in. And that that's something I really can't help you guys with because I am an engineer. So if anybody's got some recommendations for some YouTube channels that teach songwriting skills, I would be more than interested in hearing about it and possibly even collabing at some point. I think that might be really fucking cool. Um, the one person I will, will add though into that list is Trey Xavier from Gear Gods. He does Twitch streams every Sunday where he writes a song in a couple of hours every single week. And if you want to get into songwriting, maybe you might want to check it out. It's pretty damn cool. For metal, what is the best? I want to sound like Avenged Sevenfold. Honestly, I really don't know who recorded Avenged Sevenfold. And the problem with wanting to sound like someone is you're going to wind up chasing your tail for an awfully long time before you realize it's ultimately futile. Because to get those tones, you need the, the right cabinet with the right mic and the right room and all those other little factors that go into creating a tone and recreating that stuff in your bedroom can be kind of difficult. I was after the In Flames guitar sound since about 2005 and I only figured it out maybe in the last year. So that was, I don't know what, 12, 13, 14 years it took me to get it right. So just be prepared to put in a ton of work. On the other hand, you can just try and get your own sound and that might help. Once again though, custom impulses from the producers that actually made those tones can probably shortcut that whole process quite a bit. I got an AAS in audio production from my community college. Are there any other types of degrees I should go for? No, you've probably got far more than you need, to be honest with you. The big thing is at studios, nobody really gives a shit about what degree you got from a college or whatnot. The first thing I always ask somebody who's hitting me up for an internship or anything like that is, okay, what have you done? Let's check it out. Let's hear what you've done. Um, a piece of paper is merely that, a piece of paper. If you've got some capability, that's what we really want to know. So I would not recommend spending more on uh, college education at this point. If you were going to spend more money, I'd recommend buying your own gear and putting some time in and really cutting your teeth on that and learning how shit works. That's far more important than a piece of paper from a college. Nice new kit, but I have a question. If I have a bad sounding snare, is it all right to blend it with a sample? Well, of course it is. If you're just starting recording drums and you're not happy with the snare sound you get, it, you, sh you can blend samples with it, absolutely. But hopefully you're gonna learn something along the way and not keep relying on those samples as you get better. As you put more time in, um, hopefully your skills are going to increase and you're gonna wonder, well, how the fuck can I make that sound on my own? How can I get something truly unique? The problem with blending snares is you wind up sounding like everybody else who's blending snares and the real drummer gets lost along the way. I don't have a problem so much, you know, if it's for songwriting or demoing or that kind of shit. I just really, really can't stand it when drum sound samples wind up on all kinds of commercial releases and everything sounds the same. That is fucking boring. Awesome video as usual, Glenn. My question is about recording drums. Is it possible to place a mic inside a tom close to the head and mix it with a mic outside of the drum? If so, what mic would you use? Does anybody record this way? Has anybody tried it? Um, I've seen some things like called the May miking system where they actually have internal mounts uh, you can put a mic inside the drum, but I'm not a particularly huge fan of it myself. I find it just kind of kills the top end on the attack on the toms, that kind of thing. Um, I was recording with Warren a couple years back at Sunset Sound, and uh, he had the toms mic to top and bottom. Not internally though, just top and bottom uh, with a pair of 421s. And one was here, one was underneath, and they flipped the phase on the bottom one. One was a bright mic, one was a dark mic, and all he had to do was move the faders here on the console to blend the sound and get it perfect. It was a super, super cool technique. And the only problem is, you know, 421s are like $350 each or something like that. So if you've got cash to spare, you can try that. Uh, meanwhile, I'd say maybe try the Lewitt Tom mics from the Beat Pro 7 kit. That, th those sound just as good as 421s in my opinion. They're only like 99 bucks. Uh, definitely worth taking a look at. I think what you're asking though, you're probably worried about the drummer hitting the tom, hitting the tom mic more than anything. Um, just make sure to keep your mics backed off far enough so he won't do that. 
and get a drummer who actually, you know, is not a complete need it. That might help too. As a semi-unknown drummer that has over a decade of experience, what should I charge for being a session drummer? Is it possible to make money that way? Well, if you're unknown, probably not. Nobody's gonna wanna pay for you if nobody knows who the fuck you are. That's the real rub. I mean, in towns like Los Angeles and Nashville, yes, they've got session players, but it's usually a very limited group of people because they've got not only gonna be fantastic musicians, they've gotta be fantastic people and just easy to work with. Nobody's gonna to wanna to hire somebody with a fucking ego who's just gonna insert themselves onto a fucking record. Well, I think it should be like this. I think it should be like this. Nobody's paying you for that. No, they want you to show up, be able to fucking play the song at the drop of a hat and get it fucking right the first time. That's what it takes to be a session player. So if you think you can do that, hey, more power to you. If you've got the skills to do that, even better. Just make sure you're easy to work with because that's more important than anything. But if you're a total unknown or semi-unknown, uh, you might want to ask if you can guest on a couple of records, maybe some of your friends and whatnot, and maybe build up a portfolio of such so you can take to bands and say, hey, I'm a session guy. Or hit Instagram, hit, hit Facebook, hit the socials and put out a demo video of you playing saying, I'm available and make sure you say easy to work with. I think that might be your best approach, dude, but what should you charge? Probably not a lot to begin with because nobody's gonna wanna pay anything if nobody knows who the fuck you are. Greetings and fuck you, Glenn, from Los Angeles. Question about VST compressors for vocals. I understand the use of hardware compressors for vocals. I also get using VST compressor for vocals as a post effect. Reaper has the ability to put a VST on the incoming during recording. I've not experimented with this yet or learned about it yet, but it seems like it would be the same results as a hardware compressor. Question is, but that produce better results than having it in post effects. Well, I usually use a hardware compressor on the way in, so I don't peek out the fucking meters and cut off my tone when I start yelling and screaming and shit. Uh, plus having a distress in the background makes for a fun anger meter and you can always tell when I'm really pissed off. Now, the studio's still kind of all torn to pieces right now because we still need to wire up this beast and get all the compressors and the credenza hooked up to it and that kind of thing. That's gonna be a big fucking job. So in the meantime, I'm actually using a Universal Ap Apollo and uh, we're using a software distressor and it's actually clamping down on the signal as it comes in before it gets recorded so I don't peek out all over the place. And I gotta say, I'm pretty impressed with the job it's doing, but I'm not gonna give up my hardware distressor anytime soon. Definitely worth the investment in the long run. I've had mine since 2003 and I wouldn't part with it for anything. Hey Glenn, I love some videos on creating classic new wave of British heavy metal and hair metal drum and guitar sounds. I prefer the more dynamic guitars on Maiden, Priest, and Sabotage over the heavily saturated modern metal sound. I'd love to hear your take on it. Actually, that sounds like a lot of fun. I'd love to do that. Um, I'm gonna maybe beg Warren to let me borrow his plexi. Maybe we can get some like, you know, some priest-like tones in here. And maybe we can do like a, a lesson on how to get, you know, classic metal drum sounds like we're on British Steel or Peace of Mind or that kind of thing. You know, drum sounds are just, fucking super organic and just kill it and still sound better, mostly over-processed bullshit, you know, some 35 years later. I think that'd be a great idea. I'm totally gonna do that. Tell you what, if anybody in the West Hollywood area has a plexi they'd like to bring in for a few days and let me borrow and try and experiment and get some interesting sounds, uh, hit me up. I would love to hear from you. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Hey Glenn, how's it going? Uh, please don't kill me for copying. I've seen you ranting on drummers, bassists, vocals, and lead guitars, but never on rhythm guitars. Do you remember a session where the rhythm guitarist completely fucked up his or her guitar parts, like completely screwed up? Cheers and fuck you, Glenn from India. Well, of course I did. I've seen a lot of rhythm guitar players come in and just do brilliantly, and I've seen guys get nervous and completely choke. I've seen really great guitar players come into the studio and completely choke. We call it red light fever. You know, as soon as that record button goes on, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're a brilliant guitar player. They're, they're gonna be the next Ingvi. You hit the record button, that light goes on and they're a bumbling idiot. It, it just happens. Uh, one of my favorite stories was uh, the group Face Down. I did two albums with them in the early 2000s. The second one we did live off the floor. Two guitar players and a drummer. And you know, we had just had this awesome vibe. Record was called uh, Blinded by Delusions. If you want to check that out, it was a lot of fun. The, the title track had just such a killer vibe on it. But uh, one of the guitar players name was Lear and his nickname was Lightning Fingers Lear because he could really fucking play well until we sat down and recorded that fucking record because he kept fucking up over and over and over again. And finally, I started keeping a tally. We, we had the Lear mistake count where you one, two, three, four, five. You know, we, he, we had like, I don't know, 27, 28 mistakes by the end of that day. It's pretty good. Um, lightning fingers got changed to butter fingers at that point and uh, kind of stuck with them for a while. And I remember he used to work at the uh, local music store 
uh, Longer McQuaid's there in Windsor. I remember telling the story to a client of mine, and a few days later, I walked into Longer McQuaid's, and Larry's just looking at me like, fuck you, man. I'm like, what? He says, well, some kid came in here the other day and asked me if I was Butterfingers. <laughs> Dude, you were fucking amazing. That was a lot of fun. Hey, Glenn, nothing to do with recording or music, though, do you sport any tattoos? If so, how many have you got, or if not, have you ever considered getting one? Well, I did consider getting one, you know, maybe 20 years ago, and then I realized, hey, I've got more important things to spend my money on, like music gear and microphones and preamps and all that cool shit. So, no, I never really got into the tattoo thing. And these days, even though, even though I can afford one, it's like, yeah, you know what? Nobody really needs to see... Um, you know, a brand new tattoo on, on a 48 year old who could probably stand to run a few laps. So let's not do that. That's not to say I don't appreciate tattoos and tattoo culture and all the shit that goes in with that. So one person I really admire in the whole tattoo game is a guy I went to high school with and that dude's name is John Wayne. And um, here's a guy who's, you know, spent the last 20, 30 years perfecting his craft and just getting better and better and better. I remember back when he was, you know, painting Metallica logos on the back of jean jackets. Uh, now he's one of the most highly sought after tattoo artists in the Windsor area, and you usually have to book with him a year in advance if you want to get a sitting with him. And it's definitely worth the wait, and people do wait because he is that good. So hats off to him. I can definitely appreciate the, the skill that goes into making great, great tattoos. I just can't the idea of sitting there in a chair for four hours while somebody fucking tortures me. No, I, I think I'll pass. All right, everybody, that is it for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Hope you're going to have an amazing weekend. And to all my friends out there across the British Commonwealth, have an amazing May 2-4 weekend. Have a safe May 2-4 weekend. Don't get too stupid. And don't forget, I've got the weekend sale on this Got polio, me neither, t-shirt. Get it now before it is gone because it will be gone for good. Links in the description below. I'm freaking out of here. Hey guys, if you like the video, be sure to subscribe as I post every Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. If you want to learn more about recording, check out one of my tutorials or one of my gear reviews if you want the actual honest truth about a piece of equipment. Till next time, stay metal, my friends.